Oh, and then of course my <laughs> my phone starts. A webinar. I'm so pleased that you have joined us today. We've got quite a nice crowd. Um, now I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving and, and that you're well recovered from that. But we all know that growing in high tunnels can be, uh, can be quite challenging. It raises new problems that we don't normally see in the field. So the purpose of this new monthly webinar series is to address those day-to-day -day challenges that high tunnel growers face in the northern Great Plains. Now, as our first speaker, I'm so delighted to welcome Dr. Sally Miller. Um, Dr. Miller is professor in the Department of Plant Pathology at The Ohio State University. Uh, she specializes, specializes in research and extension in vegetable crop diseases, and she's assembled a, a great team of undergrads, graduate students, postdocs, and visiting scientists that focus on researching the biology and management of bacterial and fungal diseases of vegetables. Um, so they've got a great website um, that you should visit. She's got quite a bit of information out there. Um, and I'll send you the link to her website um, after this webinar. Um, but Dr. Miller has had a, an illustrious career and was named a fellow by the American Phytopathological Society in 2011. And she was elected the president of that society for this year. Uh, so welcome, Sally. And she's going to be presenting on identifying and managing diseases in high tunnels. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Esther. I'm really pleased to, uh, to present this webinar today. It's a beautiful day here in Ohio. It's actually kind of warm, and I know it's probably chillier up where you are. And I will use this as a, a chance to say, of course, what I'm talking about here is... Um, uh, our, or our experiences in Ohio, so there might be a bit different for you because of the differences in the climate. But I think because, again, these are high tunnels, there will be quite a lot of similarities. Okay, so let's talk about disease in high tunnels. The high, these kind of structures provide a unique microclimate for plants and pathogens. So what happens is that because you're protected, uh, if the plants are protected from rain pr primarily, uh, that, that will eliminate certain diseases or, or reduce them to incons or, or extremely low levels. But it can, because humidity tends to be higher and temperatures are higher, you may have other diseases you don't see in the field. So uh, that is one of the key things with that differentiates. So sometimes growers who've been growing tomatoes, for example, for a long time are surprised or are a little perplexed when these diseases show up in a high tunnel that they have never seen before. Um, also, depending on a number of factors, uh, diseases can be different in different high tunnels on a single farm. Now, there, uh, for foliar diseases, primarily, you can use fungicides in high tunnels. We'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. But there are a limited, because of the regulations, uh, on use under greenhouses and high tunnels. Uh, you can use a, manipulate the environment in a high tunnel to a certain extent. Uh, a lot of what we know about high tunnels, uh, we're extrapolating from greenhouses and some greenhouses uh, have, uh, are more, much more sophisticated than high tunnels, so they have a lot more ability to manage the environment. But again, still there is a possibility of doing that, and primarily you're looking at moisture and humidity control. Well, let's start first with some abiotic disorders of, uh, we'll just talk about them briefly. Uh, that can happen. And so these are where you don't have a pathogen, but you still have a problem with the plant. And there are a lot of them. We see quite a few of these come into our diagnostic clinic every, uh, every year from high tunnels. And again, they can be caused by a number of things. Uh, soil condition, pH, for example. Of, uh, most uh, vegetable crops don't like to stand in water, so water can be a problem. Air pollution can be concentrated in a high tunnel. Uh, Excesses or, um, or limitations on nutrients are a very common problem, especially, well, I say this probably more a problem in hydroponic systems where it's a lot trickier to get the nutrients right. If you have good soil, it's not as much uh, of a problem. Sometimes we can see chemical burns where chemicals or pesticides are applied, maybe the temperature is too high. Uh, inside that high tunnel, you can see some phytotoxicity and then genetic disorders can happen. 
Now this is one called edema, a problem that we see fairly often in high tunnels. And that's when you have cool overcast conditions and very humid and the soil is saturated. And what happens is that the plants can't get rid of the excess water in the system. So you get these water filled pustules that they burst and form get kind of cork over. So it's kind of a rough corky thing. And again, it's not a disease and it tends not to cause severe problems in the, uh, how, in the high tunnel or greenhouse, but it is rather disconcerting when, uh, when a grower sees that. Here's another thing that this is damage from uh, heating systems. If there is uh, heat being applied and maybe internal, uh, the incomplete combustion, uh, you can get gases that cause these kind of problems. And one of the problems with it is it does look like uh, bacterial canker and that's its kind of scary thing. But once the, the heating problems are eliminated, these usually uh, clear up. Now this, I'm bringing up herbicide damage because I'm sure most farmers are aware uh, and extension folks of the controversies over, over um, uh, especially the dicamba uh, herbicides and drift issues. And we normally see a couple of samples with uh, tomato plants or other vegetables with what we believe is uh, herbicide damage. And we always get uh, help from our weed scientists on diagnosing those things. But uh, we had quite a number. We had 10 samples, which is about 10 times more than usual, uh, with, herbic with suspected herbicide damage this spring. And the, most of those came from high tunnels. So you know, if there is drift, it can concentrate underneath the high tunnel if the sides have been open. So uh, again, dicamba is an issue here, or 2,4-D damage. You can also occasionally see glyphosate damage that's drifted, uh, and that's very typical. This is strawberries on the right, but um, uh, this kind of uh, uh, bleaching on the leaves is very fairly typical of glyphosate. So there are others as well, but those are the main ones that you might see that are herbicide, and they're kind of difficult to, uh, to diagnose for sure because some viruses will cause some similar symptoms, but um, and also it's often hard, hard to find the source because a drift can be coming from a long ways away. Okay, so let's get into foliar, the foliar diseases caused by fungi and what we call oomycetes like Phytophthora. So one of the ones we growers tend to have a problem with is white mold. And this is a fungus called Sclerotinia sclerotiorum. Uh, usually it's not a problem in the open fields because it relies on high relative humidity. And uh, essentially, the fungus produces these black structures you see down here. And they, in the springtime or when those conditions are cool and humid uh, and they have adequate moisture, they will produce uh, a fruiting structure and the spores are released and then they eventually will kill a plant. So uh, they germinate. So here's a tomato. You can see this wilting like this. And often you'll just see one plant here and another plant there. If it gets severe enough, you can see quite a few dead plants inside the high tunnel. And here's the one where you can actually see the sclerotium there uh, forming on the outside, even where the red arrow is. I assume you're able to also see my moving arrow. That's correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Another issue is a powdery mildew. Uh, more often I've seen this in greenhouses than in high tunnels, but you can get it in high tunnels. Uh, this is a powdery mildew is a different disease than most uh, in that it's it's inhibited by free moisture on the plant surface. But again, like a lot of others, it does favor it's favored by high relative humidity, so it can really seriously cause um, uh, problems if you get in in a high tunnel. Uh, again, so far we don't see it too much, but it certainly can happen. It can co really cause uh, serious problems. It's difficult to control. The good thing, or the, I wouldn't hate to say anything good about diseases, but usually it's easy to diagnose. And, and if one catches it, when it just has a few of these little colonies forming, like the little white one you see there, or, or these, if there are just a few and can take some action, then usually uh, reduce the relative humidity and even possibly use some fungicides, it can, uh, can be put, gotten under control. But when it gets really bad, it's very difficult to control. 
Now, botrytis is another uh, pathogen that really causes a problem on in the greenhouse on all kinds of crops. It has a very wide host range. Uh, but on tomato, you can get some of the symptoms here. It can kill the flowers. You can get stem cankers. On fruit, it can actually, uh, actually rot the fruit like you're seeing here. And all of this up on the the calyx and the uh, peduncle are all spores of botrytis. And if you've grown anything in greenhouses for a while, you've probably seen botrytis. Sometimes it causes these V-shaped lesions like this, and then this is what we call ghost spot. And you can see this on green fruit or ripe fruit, and you see these little circles, that's botrytis, where basically the, the pathogen is kind of a weak pathogen, and it got started on the fruit, and then it kind of aborted the uh, so it won't re rot the fruits, but still those, those circles on there are make it unsaleable. So it is a problem. Again, this is another pathogen that's very much favored by high relative humidity and cool to warm temperatures, but it, hot temperatures not so much, but coolish temperatures. Then this is another foliar disease, or two of them actually. I doubt that you have black leaf mold. In the, lower, uh, the lower pictures, that tends to be a... a a southern disease, but we did find it in southern Ohio a couple years ago. But this one, uh, yellow leaf mold on the top, is um, very, very common in greenhouses. And it's very easy to diagnose because you have these yellow patches on the surface and you look underneath there are these uh, patches of furry uh, fungus that's growing there. It's kind of an olive green color. Okay, another one then is late blight. And this is an occasional problem. Again, I think if you, most of folks know about late blight, and that is a, a disease that's favored by cool, wet conditions. Uh, this picture was actually taken in a greenhouse uh, 20 years ago, uh, and the entire greenhouse was destroyed over a weekend by this, uh, this disease. So if you have the right conditions, cool and wet, um, and inoculum around, and that's another issue. So the, the inoculum is not always present. So if you have all those, the uh, sort of the trifecta of, of things around um, all the negatives, you may have a problem. And um, it can proceed very quickly. So it can be inside of a high tunnel, uh, even if it is, you know, I'll protect it from rain because if the spores blow in and land, and then you can get uh, high relative humidity and, and move, move things, things can be moved around. Okay, so then let's move on from the fungi and oomycetes to talk about bacteria. And there are only, I believe, two I'm going to talk about, but the, the first one is a biggie, and that is the bacterial canker. And I, outbreaks of bacterial canker can happen uh, in, in the field, and they're very common in the field, or in the, um, greenhouse or high tunnel. This is a easily tr mechanically transmitted disease, so it can it go it's systemic, it's in the, um, the plant's vascular system, so any kind of harvesting operations or, or uh, uh, trimming plants, any kind of thing where plants are handled, the sap can be moved around from plant to plant and it can become a, a really, really serious problem. And this is a seed-borne disease, uh, but it can also persist in soil. Interestingly, it does not, we don't find it in the southern United States or in tropical countries, like, uh, for example, in Florida or most of the tropics, because it just doesn't survive very well in very high condition, high temperatures. But in the temperate zones, it survives very nicely, and then once it's introduced on seeds, it can last for a number of years in the soil. And then this is another one called tomato pythnocrosis. This is a different bacterial pathogen. And it is very ugly what it does. You can see here that it gets into the pith of the tomato uh, stem and just pretty much uh, liquefies it. And you can see here an earlier stage of that. And this is a set, it's very common in high tunnels, but it's not generally uh, a rapidly moving thing that you'll find great blocks of plants affected. It's usually one here and one there. Don't really understand why that is. The bacteria are common in the soil and they get into the plant when there are wounds. And it is favored by cool nights and high humidity, but also high soil nitrogen levels. So that's where we tend to find it when there's a little too much nitrogen happening or other imbalances in the soil. Okay, let's move on to viruses. And again, viruses can be very 
uh, unforgiving and if we certainly want to keep them out of high tunnels as any tomato production system or any vegetable production. So there I'm going to split these up into the insect transmitted viruses and then the mechanically transmitted. So primarily thrips transmitted viruses are the are the concern in greenhouses and uh, the main one is tomato spotted wilt virus and that is primarily transmitted by western flower thrips although it probably as some as uh, some other thrip species may be important as well but that's the main one and there are some other tospo viruses I have a picture I'll show you another one and these are very um, uh, difficult uh, diseases because it's hard to see the thrips. A lot of times they, um, uh, they're they just hiding in flowers or they're hiding and you can't find them and you don't see them and so they're not controlled and then they can infect the, uh, transmit those viruses to the plants and the, the symptoms are very severe. You can, it, depending on with, when the plants are inoculated. So when the plants get a virus, if they're young, they may not grow out of it at all and they may be very stunted and necrotic. As you'll see here up here on the, on the left, you can see necrosis and curling and also some mosaic -y type symptoms. And then you get these misshapen fruits with uh, various kinds of spots. And I'll, I'll show you in the next picture uh, a separate uh, uh, TOSPO virus. We call these TOSPO viruses all the related uh, tomato spotted wolf type viruses. And then you may also see aphid transmitted viruses like uh, cucumber mosaic virus. Uh, this was on peppers, uh, but it's not so common. This again is another is another TOSPO virus called tomato chlorotic spot. We found this in a high tunnel in 2013 in Ohio. We didn't see very many kind of symptoms on the foliage, but the fruits were having these ring spots and this kind of necrosis like this. Here's a big ring spot on this one. And in all these cases where we in our uh, situations have found TOSPO virus problems, it's in greenhouses where seedlings were raised near or with ornamental plants. And ornamental plants are very big carriers of TOSPO viruses and also thrips. So we have to be really careful. We always recommend that vegetables are not produced in the same um, in the same uh, uh, greenhouse as uh, ornamentals of any kind because they can harbor these TOSPO viruses. And the worst thing you can have is for TOSPO viruses to be introduced um, in, in the seedling stage. So the TOSPO viruses can be mechanically transmitted, but most, mostly moved around by uh, thrips. But uh, these are mechanically transmitted viruses, and they tend to be problems in greenhouses, uh, again, because there's so much handling of the plants. And so um, uh, tobacco or tomato mosaic virus are very similar, and uh, you really can't tell them apart by symptoms, but they can, if here you tend to see a mosaic -y type of symptom and a lot of distortion of the leaves. Here you can see uh, stunting and very severely distorted seedlings, uh, leaves on and other tissues on these seedlings. Uh, another one is Pepino mosaic virus and I, I have to say we haven't seen a lot in high tunnels but it is a huge problem in greenhouses. And you can get these kind of symptoms you're seeing here which is kind of a mottling appearance on the fruits and you'll see leaf symptoms as well. And then the last one I just want to mention are viroids, and they are related. They're they're um, uh, they're basically naked nucleic acids. They don't have the protein coat like viruses, uh, but they are also mechanically transmitted. And they can really uh, this one's potato spindle tuber viroid, and they can really uh, destroy a system. Again, we have seen these, or they have been. Uh, recorded in greenhouses, but uh, high tunnels, I haven't, we haven't seen them in Ohio anyway. Okay, so then I'll talk about soil-borne diseases because these are becoming more and more um, of a problem. And uh, a lot of that is because uh, many high tunnels are not movable. And so the same tomatoes may be grown year after year after year. We had uh, a grower in Southern Ohio who had tomatoes year after year for 15 years, and that's the, the picture you see in here. Uh, they got, finally got to the point where they really weren't uh, getting uh, much yield at all out of these plants. They were stunted and they had all these symptoms. This is 
pretty much an unmovable greenhouse. So they had, uh, and we'll talk about how you might go about dealing with some of these problems. Obviously, the easy one is to move it somewhere else uh, to move the high tunnel, but we can, again, we'll talk about that. So why are these soil-borne diseases becoming more severe? And I will say that, that in Ohio, the high tunnel um, uh, interest and, and people using high tunnels has been going on for about 15 to 20 years. I would say we've had greenhouse production for longer than that. But, but the high tunnels really started emerging in the last 10 or 15 years. And so we have people who have been, you know, producing without uh, rotating for quite a while. So that results in... Um, most people want to grow tomatoes because those are very high value. So you don't have a lot of options for rotating to other things that are just, um, you know, different plant families that are just as valuable. Uh, again, you don't have host-free periods technically, uh, or they're reduced because you can grow tomatoes for a long time, and so then the pathogen populations can build up. Now you might also have reduced winter kills of pathogens or um, perhaps vectors. Um, the environmental conditions, as I mentioned before, can favor certain pathogens, and then you won't have the reduction of these pop populations. So here are some of the diseases that you we typically see. These are Fusarium and Verticillium wilts, and, and they're fairly um, rec not so easy by looking here to differentiate them, but you can recognize them as a wilt with this kind of uh, discoloration in the tissue. Here you have the vascular tissue browning like that. Um, with verticillium, you often see these V-shaped lesions on the leaves. With fusarium, uh, you're going to see yellowing in general and this kind of dieback of the plants, but you also often just see one side uh, of the plant. So if you can imagine that back here, you see this is where all the diseases, uh, the discoloration in the stem and that kind of coincides with one side having uh, symptoms. Now we're also seeing quite a lot of fungal root rot complexes. And so um, these populations where uh, if you had a long rotations, you might not see them. They're kept at fairly low levels. They can grow up pretty high and enough to uh, cause some damage. We're also finding fun fungal disease complexes, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, where these fungi act together to cause damage to the plants. So one of the diseases I'll talk about is brown root rot, and this is caused by Colletotrichum cocodes, which is also a, uh, causes anthracnose, as you see here. So anthracnose, of course, is extremely common on tomatoes, and those tomatoes drop to the ground. Uh, perhaps they're not cleaned out of the, of the um, high tunnel, and that inoculum goes right into the soil, and eventually that causes this brown root rot. We're not sure how important brown root rot as a, a yield limiting factor is at this point. But we do know that it can be, is often found together with something that is pretty, pretty serious called corky root rot, and that's another fungus, pyronychida. For ships, you know, for us, it's critical. Pardon? Okay. Um, so, um, Let's go on. Then, then we have some other players, Fusarium, Epithium, and uh, Rhizoctonia. There are probably others as well. So here are some symptoms. This is uh, uh, a Pyronychida or Corky root rot. You'll look for these, these uh, cracked symptoms on the roots. Sometimes you'll find that also cracking in the crown when it's very serious and you see these dark roots here. That's very typical. Here's another one where you see these kind of bands of of dark uh, roots um, where they're necrotic and have been affected. So if you're looking for the combination, you might see uh, and look with a hand lens, you will see these little little tiny black dots and that's very typical of the Colichotricum. That's part of the fungus structure that's growing on those roots. Now, nematodes, um, if you would ask me, a couple, only a few years ago, are nem root knot nematode a problem in Ohio? I'd say no. We, you know, we never see root knot nematode, but with high tunnels, because they, the soils tend to be warmer for longer, uh, we are seeing a lot of root knot nematode. And in southern Ohio, we see 
see one that makes a big knots like this, and this is a, a southern root knot nematode, and in the north, we'll see a one that's more a smaller kind of galls, and that's a northern root knot nematode. So I think that this is one that we were going to have to deal with in the as we go along in the future, but it has really not been a problem much in the past. And that being said, I would say even in the field, out in the outdoors, uh, we're seeing more nematode problems than in vegetables than we had seen in the past, which is uh, kind of surprising to me, but interesting. Okay. So let's go on to disease management. So um, we, we love, and plant pathologists, we love to have um, pyramids, but this one is about IPM. So essentially it's, it's when you start from the bottom up, uh, how do you uh, manage these diseases or manage the crop so that you limit diseases as much as possible? So the major part should be prevention. Uh, you have cultural practices, sanitation, and you can have physical mechanical barriers, for example, or treatments. And then biological control and chemical control should be uh, the least uh, used uh, practice. So clean planting materials are very keen. For example, bacterial canker, as you saw, uh, I mentioned was a seedborne. There are these viruses, tobacco mosaic virus, or tomato mosaic are also seedborne as is pepino and the viroid. So it's important to eradicate or reduce those bacterial or viral pathogens on or in the seed. Um, we have, uh, here's a, I've got two uh, websites here and this is within my vegetable disease facts website. And these are, there are videos here on how you can do chlorine treatment and hot water seed treatment. And some people use acid treatment as well. Some people use, uh, trisodium phosphate for viruses, but essentially, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, Clorox treatment will kill most of the viruses. So um, with hot water treatment is really only necessary if you have a concern about bacterial canker. If that's the case, because bacterial canker can be inside the seeds and the Clorox treatment will not necessarily um, take care of that problem. What we recommend now is that if you are going to do a hot water treatment, uh, is that you also follow that up with a Clorox rinse in case you have viruses because the hot water will not take care of the viruses. Okay, so again, there are videos here and also uh, that will give you a link to our fact sheet on that. So inspect all the transplants that are going into high tunnels, make sure that there aren't any diseases, uh, roots of diseases or foliar, and take out any infected plants. Now another uh, uh, sort of foundation of disease management is the use of resistant varieties. Uh, of course, unfortunately, we don't have uh, resistance to everything. Now a lot of varieties are available that have resistance to tomato mosaic virus or tobacco mosaic virus, but unfortunately not all the heirlooms that people like to grow in, um, uh, in high tunnels are necessarily uh, are, are resistant, are not, let's say most of them are not resistant. So I think you really have to uh, be careful about the, um, these, make sure you have clean seed when you're dealing with heirlooms and you don't have the resistance uh, available. You can check with your seed supplier. One of the things I do like to say though, is a lot of times a seed catalog will say something is tolerant to a particular disease. And usually that means partially resistant. So they'll say resistant if it's a pretty good, almost immunity type of resistance. But if it's, uh, if it's partially resistant, they will call that tolerant. Now, uh, grafting is another uh, uh, excellent means of dealing with some of these problems. So essentially what we can do is we can take a disease resistant rootstocks and graft the scion that we want onto that. So a lot of rootstocks are available right now that are resistant uh, to numerous diseases. And um, it's grafting is a process that is um, rather specialized. And it's not necessarily, I mean, people can pick it up there. You'll see down at the bottom here is our grafting guide from Ohio State University. Um, and uh, it certainly could be done. 
uh, by uh, individual growers, but a lot of times we can just purchase those from propagators. You can even buy them from Johnny's. Now they're going to cost more than a uh, grafted plant might cost three dollars per plant, but some of these seeds are sixty cents to a dollar anyway. So you might want to think of that um, when you, uh, if you have some soil borne problems. And in fact, the truth is that, that almost all the tomatoes that are used in hydroponic, the conventional greenhouse tomatoes, are grafted. And it's partly, that's partly disease resistance because it's hydroponic. They're not seeing the soil borne pathogens that you see when you have a soil system. But um, most of these rootstocks are also really vigorous. And so they impart uh, quite a lot of vigor to the plants and that usually translates to higher yields. So when you want to select the rootstock, uh, either whether you're purchasing a rootstock or, or purchasing seeds or you're purchasing grafted plants, you really should know what the problems you've had in your high tunnel and so you know what kind of rootstock that you should be looking at. Now Maxifort and Beaufort are extremely popular varieties and they have multiple disease, disease resistance. None, none of these are resistant to bacterial canker, but they have root knot nematode, some of them, to some forms of the root knot nematode, and numerous of these fungal diseases. And we already mentioned the cost. And then uh, if you're doing it yourself, it just takes a while to learn how to do it, but once you do that, then it can work. Now there is a description of commercial tomato rootstocks that's updated annually, and you can find that on the internet. I'm afraid, I'm sorry I didn't put the, the link there. Okay, so um, the next thing is rotation. And again, we know that, that rotation options can be limited, but high tunnels can be built to be temporary structures. It can be moved from one location to another. And um, this was actually on our research farm. And uh, I can tell you that even though this is a movable structure, it, it uh, withheld some very high winds. Uh, so I think it can, they can be a, a, an option in a lot of situations. Obviously, if you have immovable structures and you want to rotate, they, you want to do different families, although certain things like, uh, for example, white mold has a very uh, wide host range and even crop rotation won't help with that. Okay, so you might also think about environmental manage management, which is, first of all, is avoiding overwhelming watering and most high tunnels are using drip systems so that should not be a problem. You should really not rely on any kind of uh, uh, overhead watering in a high tunnel situation even if, with, if it's with a hose. It's really better to have a drip system. Uh, again, uh, we like to have the humidity as low as possible as you head into the evening to uh, reduce the chance of these uh, fungi germinating with high humidity. Um, soils should be well drained. Uh, try to moderate the temperatures. Of course, if you have experience with high tunnels, you know it's pretty hard. You have limited options, which are rolling up the sides and the end, opening up the ends. Some have uh, installed fans, which helps as well in the high tunnels. So the other thing you can do, and we've seen quite a bit of uh, success with this with growers, is, is really to, to plant those uh, I have wide plant spacing so that you really get uh, plenty of ventilation within the, the canopy. And that also to prune them, staking them, and trellising them as well. So that really you want to uh, keep the humidity in that microclimate around the leaves and the stems as, uh, as low a humidity as possible. When the seedlings are being produced, obviously you want to have clean planting mix and most growers or propagators are doing that. Um, and in that system, if you have somebody growing for you, uh, you want to check what they're doing, make sure they have clean floors and they have gravel or plastic uh, floor covering so they're not picking up pythiums or rhizoctonias or other pathogens. The pathogens can be, uh, the surfaces can be disinfested to get rid of those pathogens. And there are a number of options and I'm going to show you some more in a, in a little or show you some data we have in a moment. Uh, you know, of course you use flats and you can use clean flats, but they really should be sanitized. So again, they need to be soaked uh, in, uh, in one of these um, disinfectants for uh, at least 10 minutes. 
And then also workers need to wash their hands regularly and there should be no smoking. And in fact, I would go so far as to say no smokers uh, working inside of seedling production greenhouses or even in the high tunnels uh, because tobacco mosaic virus is an extremely stable virus and it can actually be transmitted from cigarettes um, onto, uh, you know, uh, handling cigarettes and onto plants. So we always recommend. Now, one thing I didn't note is that you do have somebody who is a, they, who is a smoker, you know, obviously if they could put on coveralls and also wash their hands and then a dip in like about a 50 or 50% 50 uh, dry milk solution will inactivate viruses on hands as well. So you can dip your hands in this milk solution, rinse them off, and that will help as well. And then obviously it's getting rid of disease seedlings. Now another thing is a lot of times there, you know, it's hard to keep a handle on the weeds that are growing in and around the high tunnels. And so they can harbor insect pests and some pathogens and obviously they're going to reduce the air movement and keep that relative humidity high. So weeds need to be reduced Again, take out diseased plants and even dead and diseased tissue. Uh, I, uh, some growers will, after pruning, just leave the, the, the pruned material, plant material on the ground. I think it's a bad idea. It should be taken out and disposed of. Okay, so here for sanitizing, there are many different kinds of sanitizers, alcohols, and quaternary ammoniums are very very commonly used, um, various botanicals, but they, there are a couple of things you have to think about when you're choosing a sanitizer. They have to have an effective with a short contact time within a few, few seconds, uh, if, if preferably. They should broadly be effective against viruses, viroids, bacteria, and fungi, not harmful to workers, not corrosive, or phytotoxic and economical. And so it's really hard to find a sanitizer that meets all those criteria. We did a, a couple years ago, a bunch of tests on sanitizers. Uh, we were looking at that clavibacter, the bacterial canker pathogen botrytis, which we've mentioned in these viruses and viroid that we talked about. So you don't need to um, memorize this list. It's a long list here of the different things that we try. But here, if you look, um, at the results in the end. So we put a little check mark for everything that worked really well and um, and a little parentheses around the check mark if it was sort of good but not not consistently good. So the best things that we found were 2% Vercon, which is a little bit high, but it had a very high, a short contact time of one second for a uh, clab for bacterial canker and a second as well for botrytis. Uh, another one that was quite good was and much and certainly cheap is Clorox, and that was 10% Clorox. And um, again, very short contact times. Uh, there was a little bit equivocal with Pepino, but it took care of tomato and tobacco mosaic viruses and the viroid. Now Lysol is another one that worked fairly well. It needed a bit longer contact time against botrytis and it was a little bit variable against some of the virus and viroids, but it was another one that's not too bad. So obviously the non-fat dry milk I talked about worked fairly well against the viruses and viroid, but it has no effect whatsoever on fungal or bacterial pathogens. So these are something to keep in mind when you're picking out a, a sanitizer to use to sanitize tools, sanitize the um, the sides of the high tunnel after, um, after the crop goes out, etc. So then I'll move on from sanitizers and pesticides. And I think most folks are aware, especially if you've been growing in high tunnels for a while, that their rules uh, for registration of fungicides and other pesticides are different um, for greenhouses and high tunnels than for open fields. So, um, that has to be certainly taken into account. And in Ohio and all the states that I'm aware of, and again, you can check with your extension about uh, your area as to what the, your state, because the state makes this distinction, is whether um, a high tunnel is the same as a greenhouse. So we, in Ohio, the rules are that a, a greenhouse is the same as a high tunnel or vice versa. And so the rules for greenhouses apply to high tunnels. So if, for example, here on this table that comes out of our uh, spray guide for vegetable crops, uh, 
the, this one, it happens to be insecticides, but you find exactly the same, the same thing for um, fungicides. So you'll have a group that are labeled for greenhouse use. You have a, where the label prohibits the use in the greenhouse. And then you have one where the label is silent on greenhouse use. And again, what our uh, Ohio EPA has said is if the label is silent on greenhouse use, you can use it in a greenhouse. But that could depend on your state and you really need to check that before you use any of these. And this is also only for non-restricted uh, pesticides. And of course for fungi, fungicides, we don't really have very many restricted fungicides. Okay, so when you're talking about high tunnels where you have products that you're allowed to use, um, most uh, seeds are already treated with a fungicide when they go into propagation. Um, maybe not the, um, not the uh, rootstock seeds, but essentially those, um, it's not so critical fungicide seed treatment. Uh, foliar fungicides, as I mentioned, are somewhat limited. And then the soil fungicides or fumigants are very highly restricted or they don't work. So we either um, we have not seen soil fungicides that work particularly well um, or by a lot. Uh, there are some uh, hydrogen peroxide based ones that are, are being promoted, but we have not find efficacy with those. Uh, bactericide treatments for the bacterial diseases, generally you're talking about coppers unless some biologicals but they are not highly effective against bacterial canker or pith necrosis. Uh, the only antibiotic that's allowed on tomatoes is streptomycin that's only in transplants. It's not permitted inside of high tunnels. So again, for the vector the viral diseases like thrips, there are insecticides that can be used and there will be another webinar uh, on, on this kind of um, insect control later on in your series. So what are some other options? One is uh, organic matter. So we've found that in general, adding organic matter is good for soil health. It improves the soil uh, microbial community structure. So uh, a generally a good quality compost. Uh, in a high tunnel, I wouldn't recommend manures, but cover crops are also a good thing uh, in the fall. And when the tomato crop goes out to put a cover crop in the high tunnel to improve, and that can be, um, however you choose what kind of crop you want. If it survives in through the spring, you can turn that under and then allow it to decompose and that will add some organic matter. But a good quality compost applied in the fall is um, I think one of the better things you can do for your soils. Um, sometimes these organic matter uh, amendments can cause the soils to become suppressive to diseases because it, it enhances the quality of the microbial communities that are there, the good bugs, the good bacteria and fungi, et cetera, and nematodes. And so those things will, can help uh, keep populations of the pathogens under control. There has been some use of biofumigants, mostly brassicaceous plants. And these uh, brassicas produce compounds that kill pathogens and you can use uh, as a cover crop or you can add green, uh, green tissues or seed meals. And we don't have a lot of information on that, certainly not in high tunnels, but I think that, that, that others have uh, done some research in this area. So then of course, in, when we're talking about IPM, we really like to ha look at biocontrol options, but we don't always have biocontrol as much as we would like. Um, there are drenches that you can um, apply to manage soil-borne diseases. There are also Others that can be applied foliar, uh, some of them are uh, indu resistance inducers and will kind of boost the resistance of plants. So they, uh, they're worth trying, but they're, most of these biological controls are, can be inconsistent and they will never, I haven't seen any that give 100% disease under high pressure situations. They will knock back or, or help the plants to, uh, to maintain some health even in the, the presence of pathogens. Again, just like pesticides, you make sure that those products are labeled for greenhouse use or that they, there's nothing on the label about greenhouse use or high tunnel use. They, they would, the labels will say greenhouse, they won't say high tunnel. And then uh, if you have a problem with white mold, we recommend that this Contans product, which is Coneotherium minitans, a fungus, and that basically parasitizes the 
sclerotia. And so you want to do that after you take the plant, the crop down, and apply that. And you may need it to apply uh, multiple years to get those populations down. And it doesn't necessarily take care of everything because those ascospores I mentioned that are produced by this fungus can blow into your crop from elsewhere. But if you, it will help a lot with the, um, the sclerotia, killing those sclerotia that you have inside the high tunnel. Uh, so if you're going to go, um, I think we talked about this. I apologize for that. I meant to not keep that one there. Okay, so let's move on then to the other. The last thing I want to talk about is anaerobic soil disinfestation, and that's as a means of uh, managing diseases in uh, uh, the soil-borne diseases in high tunnels. So um, I, this is started off in uh, in the Netherlands. This this uh, probably 10 or 15 years ago, and also in Japan. There's quite a lot of work done there, and then it's been tested in Florida, California, Tennessee, Michigan, and now Ohio. We've been working on that a couple years here in high tunnels and also in open field situations. So I'll go through how this works, but you add an organic matter amendment, uh, saturate the soil and cover it with plastic for uh, usually around four weeks, but uh, sometimes longer if you have, you, depending on the temperature of the soil. Soil's very warm, you can get by with a, a shorter period. And what happens during this process, the microbes break down that carbon source, they use up the oxygen, and because it's flooded, I think, you know, it can be used up. And they produce various kinds of acids and volatiles, as well as uh, in the liquid form. And these toxic byproducts uh, uh, kill the pathogen. And a lot of plant pathogens tend not to be very, uh, they're, they're really adapted for uh, infecting plants. They're not as well adapted as to surviving adverse uh, um, conditions in the soil. So, so you will often see um, a, general reduction in these populations. So you can apply this to beds or to flat soil. And I'm going to show you some data now from two sites. Uh, one of them I mentioned before that had tomato production for eight years. Another one had tomato production for 15 years or so. And they had a bunch of different problems. Verticillium root, they had that pyrotechita or uh, corky root rot complex with brown root rot, as well as root knot nematode. So you can see here, if you just look at the root not root rot severity on the left the, these are kind of uh, uh, the uh, amendments we've been working with the Japanese work with ethanol a lot it's very easy to apply it's a low concentration like one or two percent ethanol but we haven't found an inexpensive source of this yet so we have not really been pushing that we get just as good results with wheat bran and we also sometimes combine wheat bran and molasses and you can see here the significant reduction in the severity of root rot compared to our controls, whether treated or um, uh, with everything except the organic amendment. In this case, it's, uh, it's not treated at all, but also uncovered. So it's more like your normal practice. And where we see really striking results is with nematodes. It just uh, destroys the nematodes. You, um, here are the controls on the right. So here are the three steps of ASD. This is a picture from uh, what some of the work they're doing in California. So incorporate the organic matter, saturate the soil, and put the tarps on. So there are a bunch of options, as I mentioned, for carbon sources. You want to pick something that's inexpensive. So wheat bran is a byproduct, obviously. In California, they have access to rice bran. They'll use that. We, I have a student working on this in Nepal, and. Uh, and he's using lentil, uh, byproducts from lentils. Uh, so you can use whatever is available as an organic uh, material. Uh, molasses is also relatively inexpensive. We don't have a lot of experience here with cover crops, but I think that's another thing that, that could be very useful. So the rate that we generally use is six to nine tons per acre. And as I mentioned, we use wheat bran and wheat bran plus molasses. That's what we're testing. So here's a greenhouse or a high tunnel we did on a small scale. And here's another uh, larger scale uh, system that we had a soil based greenhouse in northern Ohio. So again, here's the wheat bran was put on the surface and then incorporated. 
worked into a depth of six to eight inches. Then add the molasses where molasses was being used, and you know it probably works a bit better using a, a um, uh, sprinkling can like this because molasses, even diluted, is uh, can spray up clog up spray nozzles. So then the soil is irrigated and saturated to the point where the water it begins to pond and doesn't drain. And in some systems, you may have to check that during that four to six week period and um, uh, add more water. Um, so a, a heavy plastic is used, and again, that can be the same plastic that's used. You just poke holes in it when you want to plant. Um, soil temperature needs to be above 68 uh, degrees Fahrenheit for at least the first week. And again, longer, the longer, higher temperature and longer is better. And again, most of the time we've been looking at about four to five weeks. So when you want to plant, then you can just take the plastic off or cut holes in it, allow the soil to drain for about and breathe. And one thing I will say is that it, this is a very stinky process because when that soil gets anaerobic, it's very smelly. Uh, soil, soil fertility should be checked because you are kind of messing around with your carbon nitrogen ratios. Then you can put in your transplant and then again, you, because you have a lot of carbon in there, you want to make sure that you don't have nutrient deficiencies because you might have needed some extra nitrogen that might have gotten uh, used up or complex during this process. Um, again, this is not going to destroy all the pathogens, but it will knock the populations down as you saw. And so I think that treatments may be needed uh, for several years. Now, we're, right now, mostly we're looking at fall applications because the soil is warmer in the fall than it would be in the spring. So when the crop goes out, then you would be applying this treatment. And here's a little bonus I'm just putting in at the end is that this process also kills weed propagules. I have another student working on that. Kills all sorts of weeds, especially the combination of uh, wheat bran and molasses. And so here you'll see uh, one of the high tunnels we did this fall, and um, here with the yellow are all our treated plots, and these are the control plots that were not treated. Here's the yellow one back here and here, and you can see the difference in the weeds. Uh, we also have, I didn't show the picture, but we had another high tunnel where the grower had a lot of volunteer tomatoes come up, and none of them came up during, um, after the ASD treatment. So I think the time is about up now, and that's all I I want to talk to, I particularly want to thank Anna Teston, who's a, a graduate, undergraduate uh, degree, comes from the University of Minnesota, and she's done this high tunnel work. Um, you can follow us at, at, um, at Ohio Veggie Disease News, that's my blog, and uh, again, that's kind of Ohio-centric, but we have our fact, the, the veg, vegetable disease facts uh, website, also high tunnel disease facts that are a little specialized. And then this is Twitter uh, as well. So I think I can uh, drop this, uh, exit the show and now, and I'll take questions if there are any. All right, don't be shy. You can certainly turn on your microphone and ask the question, or else you can uh, type it in the chat box. So this is your opportunity. Oh, here I see that we've got uh, a couple already in the chat box. Mm -hmm. So one from Mindy Grant says, I didn't see spinosad on any of the greenhouse pesticide lists. Any info there? Uh, I will definitely be watching that webinar on insects and insecticides. I'm afraid I don't really have uh, any specific details on insecticides. I leave that to uh, Dr. Kanyas. And uh, please do watch that one because he'll have all that. He's our specialist. Uh, on uh, protected culture, and uh, that's his, his specialty. So he'll be able to tell you what you need to know. And Mindy, we will uh, have Dr. Kanyas on on December 11th at 1 o'clock. So he will be speaking on managing aphids and thrips. So we'll be able to ask some of our um, insecticide questions there. And then one from Holly Mobby. Uh, Does tomato spotted wilt virus affect anything other than tomatoes? Is there a topsoil virus that specifically targets basil? Uh, once introduced into a high tunnel, can a topsoil virus or the thrips that carry it winter or, or over season to another season? 
Okay, Th those are good questions um, about the TOSPO viruses. So uh, the tomato spotted wilt virus has a very broad host range. And so it often is found in, in, in um, uh, ornamental plants. It, it, it can affect a lot, it can affect peppers, probably can affect basil. Sometimes it depends on whether the, the thrips like basil or not. So I, I'm not exactly sure about that. Uh, but it certainly has a very broad host range. And there are other TOSPO virus um, uh, that are related that are more often uh, found in the ornamentals like uh, um, in patients necrotic spot virus, but you can actually get that in a tomato plant as well. So it, the, the TOSPO viruses, if they are introduced when the, seed, the plants are seedlings, they can be extremely destructive and those plants just don't grow out of it. And so and the, you just won't get a crop. So that's really critical in the greenhouse not to have that uh, problem. Um, about over, overwintering, so this again, a lot like these uh, many, many of these uh, insect vectors or insect vectored viruses, it seems like everyone is different. And in this case, the, uh, the, the thrips uh, can only acquire the virus when they're feeding as larvae. So the eggs are laid by the female, they hatch, and the first, I believe it's the first instar, uh, that's the, when they're feeding, they pick up the virus. And then they maintain that virus as throughout the whole life of, the, of that uh, thrips, uh, that insect. So, and that can transmit during its life, you know. So when it starts feeding again, when it's an adult, uh, it can transmit. However, it, it does not, the females do not transmit it to the eggs. So essentially the eggs will go down and the, the larvae go in the soil and they kind of overwinter there, I believe. But, and again, uh, Luisa is going to be the expert on this, but my understanding is that, it, that the overwintering should not be a huge problem uh, with, because, because the next generation. And I, and I think a thrips insect will allow, can live 30 to 45 days. So they can continue during a season to infect. But I think the overwintering is less of a problem than bringing something in. Now, again, if, you're, if you have perennial plants, uh, you know, potted ornamentals of some sort, and they've got thrips and the virus, now that could be a way of overwintering these, uh, these pathogens, the viruses. Did I answer all the questions? I think you did, yes. Oh, great. Um, all right, so we have more questions. One from Tim Gaynert. Do diseases present the same on seedlings as adult plants? Oh, uh, that's another good question because um, it depends. <laughs> we always have to say. But generally, the seedlings, um, uh, seedlings are more susceptible to the diseases and so a lot of times a uh, plant can tolerate an infection um, when it's older. Uh, so you, if it's infected, it may be more severe. Now I will say on seedlings and I will say that for bacterial diseases, particularly bacterial canker, um, that may be present on seedlings without causing any disease. It just is called what we call an epiphyte, so it's kind of living on the surface. And then when the, the conditions are right, it may then, or wounds occur, it may call, get inside the plant and cause diseases. So, uh, so in that case, it's the opposite in that you may not show the symptoms. When you do see symptoms of bacterial canker on seedlings, they tend to be these blisters uh, on the leaves, whereas when the plants get going in the greenhouse, uh, you'll see the... Um, a different type of necrosis on leaves. And of course, bacterial canker also causes wilting and, and it will kill the plants. Next one. Is there another question? Oh, yes, there are. Um, would the mulch one uses for weed control, whether it's plastic, fabric, or straw, affect humidity and or susceptibility to soil-borne pathogens? Uh, yes, I, I, all the mulches can, can have an effect. In that, uh, but sometimes it's not a, a bad effect because because they even a straw mulch uh, or a plant-based mulch can reduce the amount of splashing. Although 
Again, inside a high tunnel, you're not going to have that much splashing if you have a drip system. But what will happen is that, that you essentially are going to keep those, um, uh, you're going to pretty much have your soil at a constant, slightly moist state. So the, that will affect the humidity. So in generally tomatoes, for example, we like to see that you keep the lower parts of the plant uh, pruned really well because then that will kind of negate any issue of a little bit of excess humidity that comes from moist soil that is coming up through the, you know, the holes in the plastic, for example. So if you really, and again, the plants don't, if you have indeterminate, particularly indeterminate tomatoes that are growing on strings, for example, if you look inside of one of the big greenhouses that the, the hydroponics, they are like a, like a little tree with a long rope at the bottom because those stems are completely, uh, Pruned. So, you know, sometimes those, those large indeterminate tomato plants that are grown in hydroponics can be 30 feet long and there will only be leaves on the top five feet or so or six feet um, because that's really all the plant needs. So again, there's no need to have, to have uh, a lot of foliage down at the bottom of the plant and it's a good idea to keep that pruned out. Okay. Um. Another question here from Kyla. In your experience with the anaerobic soil disinfestation, will this process kill all microorganisms, including the beneficial ones? And then if so, how would you build them back up? That's a, a very interesting question because in one that we've been thinking about, uh, we, it doesn't kill all the microbes. It, it increases anything that uh, it likes anaerobic conditions. And so that's one thing, but it also doesn't, for example, trichodermas can survive anaerobic soil disinfestation, which is interesting. They are not killed in that. Um, there have not been a lot of um, studies done, but the few that have been done, uh, and this is something we would like to look into a little more too, but the few that have been done, we're looking at, at microbiome analysis, for example, is that, that generally, uh, you will have lower concentrations or populations of good bacteria, of some of the good bacteria at the end of the treatment, but they tend to come back up to normal after a certain period of time. But I think there's still a lot not known about that. But they, they again, as you see, it doesn't have completely destroy all the pop pathogen populations. So it will reduce them, but not, not uh, the same goes for micro, the good micro, microorganisms. Now, a question for you on viruses. Now, with, will the anaerobic soil disinfestation help with a persistent virus like tobacco, um, uh, tobacco mosaic virus? I don't know the answer to that. I haven't seen anybody working on that, and I don't know, but that would be a good idea to find out. There are, you know, I have a student working on sclerotinia, and, and also the student who was working on weeds in this system, and you, you can bury the seeds or your weed seeds or the sclerotinia propagules, the sclerotia. You can bury those in, um, uh, in little bags and then take them out later and see if they're still viable. So that would be a good thing to try with, uh, with uh, tissue that's got uh, tobacco mosaic virus infection or tomato mosaic. I just don't know because it's such a very, very hardy <laughs> virus that I don't know if this would work or not. Yes, definitely very stable. Uh, a question from Tim Geinert. Do you have any guidance or a source of guidance for compost at a scale useful for a 3,000 square feet of high tunnel? You know, that might be a whole nother webinar. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a good idea. You should have another webinar on this because there are people who are more expert than I am. Uh, generally, I'm trying to remember how many, usually put compost on a fairly low concentration of uh, tons per acre of less than 10, I would believe. Uh, what I remember and what I've seen growers do is, is just almost looks like a dusting over the top and to work that in. Uh, and uh, again, there is a lot of information out there and I did not look that up for details, but again, it's, it's not a, a um, prohibitive amount that you would have to put on. And again, I think it's probably better to put a little bit on every year than as opposed to putting a lot on at once. All right, any other questions?
Well, as, as we're doing that, you know, I'm going to share my screen here and I'll show you what we have coming up. Here, just a moment as I... Uh, so hopefully you can see... Whoops, I'm trying... Can you see my High Tunnel webinar series screen? No, maybe not, not. Not yet. Well, I guess that's not showing up. Here, let me try one more time. Here we go. Um, are you seeing it now? Yes. <clears throat> okay, so I wanted to wanted to give you some dates here. Now, we did a little teaser um, that Luis, Luis Kenyos will be presenting uh, next. So for those of you that had insect questions, he's going to talk about managing aphids and thrips in high tunnels on December 11th at 1 o'clock. And he's also from the Ohio State University. So his talk will be a, a, a nice, a nice complement to Sally's talk. And then in January, we are going to continue with Kyla Splickle from the Williston REC, and she's going to be presenting on vegetable cultivar trials, and we still have yet to settle on a date for that. Um, now, I'm going to be sending you um, the, various, um, the various links that Sally mentioned, so you'll have access to you know, some of these fact sheets and be able to see the fantastic website that her team has developed. Um, now, if there are any of you that are not on our High Tunnel listserv and would like to be, um, you can certainly email me at esther.mcginnis at ndsu.edu, and I will put you on our High Tunnel listserv, and that will ensure that you know about our upcoming webinars um, or any other opportunities that we have. In addition, if you haven't done so already, um, please visit our Facebook page, North Dakota High Tunnels, and a uh, link to that. Um, we'll also be posting announcements on that. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop sharing here and see if we have any more questions in the chat box. Um, will the recording be posted on the listserv or somewhere else? You know, we have not decided where we will be posting it. We will e we'll be talking with Dr. Miller as to, you know, what she's comfortable with, whether it's on the listserv or on our Facebook page, or we may actually develop a website to start posting our webinars. Um, so that, um, whoops, looks like somebody, um, somebody is sharing their screen here. Let's, <laughs> okay, well, you know, if we don't have any further questions, um, we'll end for today. But I want to thank Sally for her wonderful presentation. Uh, we've learned quite a bit about um, the practical uh, disease issues and, and this anaerobic soil disinfestation seems like a very promising approach. Um, so I'll share the fact sheet that um, Ohio State has produced on that. But thank you very much. We have in, enjoyed this. Um, and if you ever, ever get a chance, come visit us in North Dakota. Well, thanks very much, and I appreciate the invitation to speak, speak to the group. And uh, again, I, if you have any questions, you, uh, my email, you can certainly share my email with people as well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, and I hope everybody um, has a good rest of the day.